and welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm lucky to sit down and talk with Mr. Rugby Strength Coach himself, Kier Wenham Flat. Kier is working with Argentina's rugby team right now in the World Cup. He has been with them for, for quite a while in this buildup. And uh, that's what we're going to wrap about today, guys. We're going to talk about the entire preparation process and how he has basically had to build a, a physical preparation program from the ground up, starting with the, the younger kids and the developmental team, building all the way up to the full side. Uh, we talk about special uh, strengths and specialized exercises for a while, You know where the ideas came from, how we developed these exercises, and even give some neat examples with those. And then he also is going to talk about how he monitors his players. And, and this is really a unique, um, interesting method. I honestly never thought of it myself. Uh, but it seems to work really well for him. Uh, and it's something that's definitely a takeaway. And I, I thought it was a really, really great idea. So let's get right to it, guys. I hope you enjoy the talk. All right. Well, Kier, thanks for being on, man. We've uh, we've been rapping them for quite a while about this interesting situation you're in down there in, in Argentina. So how about we start talking just with the big structure of everything? How uh, how you've put it together with these guys? The answer, the simple answer, is with great difficulty <laughs> because um, yeah, I was kind of wrote about this in my blog uh, recently. Like you know, when when you're learning training in university, everyone talks about four four week blocks of anatomical adaptation, strength or hypertrophy strength power and all that stuff. And the reality that we've been faced with this year is um, incredibly different to that. So the situation that we've had this year is um, we had our players come in at the start of June and we had 40 guys come in, some of whom are very young and don't play a lot, some of whom are very old and play a ton. And we had all of three weeks to get them ready for a major international competition, the first game of which was against the world champions. And then we went into a competition block of about five weeks. We've got two more weeks, which is about to start tomorrow. And uh, then we have to travel to Europe for the World Cup. So amongst all of that, we've, we've got travel, we've got competition games, and then we've got the World Cup as well. So the, the big challenge that we've had this year is to try and juggle all of those different elements um, between getting them prepared for the World Cup but also not sacrificing too much readiness so that performance doesn't suffer on the pitch because um, obviously you, you may gain a lot physically from, from overreaching the players during that competition period but there, there may be quite a lot to lose psychologically and, and tactically and technically in that. So the kind of model that we've, that we've developed over the last few years, we use a a four-phase model, and it's probably not the most scientific, but we had to keep things really, really simple for a few different reasons. One is that, I'm sure they won't mind me saying it, is that the standard of strength and conditioning coaching in um, Argentina is not the best. So we had to make it super simple. Um, another reason is that Argentina is a big country, so we, we run five different regional performance centers, and we also have to liaise with players outside of the country. Um, another reason is that we we had to develop a system that would flow nicely all the way up from you know, sorry, all the way from under 18, 19s, 20s into adult rugby and into the Pumas, which is our highest level performance team. So the the model we've developed, kind of working backwards from our, our last phase of of the four is what you would probably call like a realization phase. It's where we try and take all of the different adaptations that we've tried to develop throughout the previous blocks and and realize them in the most game-specific context possible. Because you know and I know and, and every good coach knows that ultimately it's not about how fast or big or strong you are that wins your games. It's how, how well you play your sport. All we do is, is try and increase the intensity and the repeatability of sporting skill. But we know that underpinning all of that stuff that we're trying to realize um, there are going to be a limited number of, of physical abilities and, and movements and skills that each player has to specialize in um, within their position to be maximally uh, effective and to, to define this I call it like the postcard rule uh, if you had to write down on the back of a postcard what it is that you do better than anyone else or what your position should do better than anyone else in rugby those are the things that you should be targeting in um, block three, which we kind of 
in terms of specialization. So that's where we get really specific in terms of um, the special strength drills, which obviously I learned from, from you and Natalia. Um, and we, we kind of drop everything right down in terms of retention and all the other biomotor abilities. Now, going back another phase, we know that um, underneath those position-specific abilities and biomotor qualities, there are just general outputs that will support that. So if you are bigger, stronger, faster, more explosive generally, that's going to greatly enhance your ability to, in, to improve in terms of your position. So that's our phase two, our kind of intensification. And then we know that in order to develop maximal speed, strength, and power and explosiveness, those are quite um, taxing things to train. You have to train in a maximal fashion. Uh, so in order to do that, you have to earn the right and prepare the body to do so. Because if you just jump in and start doing um, maximal training, you, you'll have great fun for a week and then you'll die. <laughs> well, not die, but you'll, you'll start to break right. apart. So our, our first phase of the four is our accumulation or, or preparation stuff. And that's where we really concentrate on addressing um, technical mastery to make sure that technique is sound before we increase loading on tissues. Um, do we have adequate work capacity to tolerate what's coming? Um, have we addressed any uh, injury risk factors, stuff like that? And um, so what we would normally do is we would go through, um, so I forgot to say, we're kind of using like a vertical integration approach with all of that. So we've identified what we think for our guys are um, developmental and retention intensities and volumes for each of those abilities. And depending on which phase we find ourselves in, we will try and emphasize a particular ability or, or quality and drop all of the other abilities down to a retention level. And then we'll try and make that flow from one into the next. So to give you an idea, um, we, we program uh, distinct elements within, our, within our, our training program. So we always have a speed or a, a change of direction section. Then we have... a uh, I call it like a high speed strength section, which would generally be stuff like our jumps, our medicine ball throws, and our plyometrics. Uh, then next we would have like a power section, which I, I consider that more like the contractile elements of, of power development rather than the elastic elements or the higher speed elements. Then we would go into strength development, and then we would go into the accessory stuff or the you know bodybuilding, and then we'll do the work capacity stuff at the end. So to give you an idea of how that would flow from phase one to phase four. Um, using, for example, the speed stuff. In phase one, we're never really going to do a, a, a sprint on flat ground. We're never really going to do a flying sprint at 100% of max velocity. We're going to do a lot of tempo. We're going to do a lot of, of drilling and kind of building up to those intensities. If we do sprint at 100% for, for accelerations, it's usually going to be with a sled or up a hill to just reduce those forces and slow it down a bit. Then as we go into phase two, we're working on those maximal outputs so we're concentrating on um, 100% speed in acceleration and top speed with good technique, uh, just trying to develop those qualities with no other distractions. As we get into phase three, we try and make those a bit more applied in terms of the athlete's position or in terms of the sport. So it might be, for example, uh, during acceleration, we'll add uh, maybe a sidestep and a fend in contact and then go into an acceleration. So just trying to make them understand what they're trying to take and transfer to the field of play. And then in phase uh, four, we, we literally just play. And um, we just do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a little more than just this. I'm sure that there's some things that you're at least this hoping to see or you have a good idea of what you're about to see when you get there. Absolutely. You know, it's, we have kind of a, not necessarily a problem, but we have a culture within rugby where athletes are taught that suffering is part of winning. And if it doesn't hurt, it's not working. And we, we have had to do some work in trying to educate players and make them realize that it's often in our best interest to try and get the most adaptation for the least biological costs. Um, you know, I try and give them the analogy like, if, if I sell you a car and you pay $5,000 more than you need to, you're an idiot. If you go out to dinner and you spend 100 bucks more on dinner than you need to, you're an idiot. <laughs> so if you're doing five sets when two's enough, you're an idiot. <laughs> and a result of that is that really we're only working hard for, let's say, four to eight weeks out of every 12. Um, so 
we do do that in phase four, but one thing we're really conscious to do is drop them way, way down in terms of the work that we're doing because obviously the, the field takes focus. And um, one thing that we stole from um, Caldeet's triphasic training is we won't really go over 50% of 1RM uh, when we're into our phase four. So like our, our phase four, we don't really do speed just because of uh, the risk that we think it poses at that point in the competition period. We do do tempo and we do do drills to try and retain the technical mastery aspect of it. Um, in, in place of the, the, the elastic stuff, we think there's quite an elastic element to the, to the time sets because we know if you're trying to do maximum reps in a set amount of time and there is a set concentric velocity that you can lift the bar, the only solution to doing more reps is to increase the speed of the eccentric, increasing stimulation of the stretch shortening cycle, and then obviously decrease that amortization phase. And then we still do the, the position-specific stuff, but we drop the volume way down. And then what we try and do in the accessory stuff and sometimes in the strength is give them, um, we don't give them hard and fast numbers and say, you have to do this many. What we do is we give them ranges within Prelepin's table with um, volume ranges according to where we are in the prep. And we'll say, um, today we're going to use, for example, 75%. You have to give me between this many reps and this many reps. You can do between this many and this many per set. You choose however many makes you feel good. And that's one thing that we've really tried to, to do and educate the players on, and that is uh, right stimulus, right time, right amount. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, teaching kids that, or well, these guys, these aren't kids. I mean, we deal with kids in college sports, but these men, I'm sure that that's difficult. But then typically something that people helps people buy in is stuff where they can see the carryover with what they do. And you do some pretty neat stuff with your special strength training. So can we touch on that a bit? Yeah, so this kind of this has been an evolution over ooh, I've been in pro sport for 5 years this month just gone. So I've I was aware of special strength and the kind of eastern block stuff before that I tried, obviously through James Smith, Elite FTS, I tried to read Yuri Verkashansky's text before the, the Special Strength Training Manual 2nd Edition came out. And quite frankly, it wasn't until I sat in a room with you and Natalia and Michael Yesis and you actually see all the pieces come together that you understand how, how clever a system it is. And you can see how one uh, element builds the foundation for the next, flows into the next, builds the next, and um, having that experience with you guys in, in 2013 was when it really took off for me. And it made me think about the, the starting point of that was I was thinking about all of those different movement skills that we do, all the different rugby skills that we do. And it seems obvious, obvious to say it, but all positions are not created equally. We are not judging all positions on their ability to perform in all um, skills you know if you're a big front row guy in the scrum you're, you can pretty much make a living on your ability to push that way there are guys that get paid half a million pounds a year to do that and not much else <laughs> you know if you're a fly half or a scrum half nobody gives a damn about how you push in the scrum they're probably going to be more in, in, interested in how you distribute the ball how you kick maybe what your lateral step is like in your first initial burst of acceleration so once we looked at that and said well you know Different skills have different orders of priority according to position. And obviously, our job is to enhance the performance of that skill. That means that we need to be prioritizing um, different biomotor abilities and different patterns within the training process. And to that end, once you get above a, a novice or an intermediate level of training, you have to perform different exercises in order to enhance those qualities. So what we did was, um, like I said, postcard on the back of a postcard, what is it that you do better than anyone else? And the answer to that question, for me, should tell you what you should be specializing in because I, I wrote a little bit about this and I think other people have written about it. Sparta have definitely said it. Charlie Francis has said it. Don't spend so long trying to target your weaknesses because sooner or later it's going to detract from making you better at what you already are. You need to be more of what you are as an athlete. And I think that's where special strength comes in definitely. So, 
what we did was we, we created a list of all the different positions and we said, what's the number one thing they have to do? There's some room in this philosophically, particularly in the backs, but basically if you're a front row forward, your job is to push in the scrum. If you are a second row uh, player in the scrum, your job is to jump in the line out. If you're a back row player, your job is to, to be explosive in the rucks and clear the ball out. Nine and 10, like I said, uh, distribution. 12 and 13, bust through the line, so kind of resisted sprinting. And then once you get into the outside backs, you're pretty much just judged on your, your pure top end speed. And we included a second criteria as well, just because we didn't want athletes to be super, super, super specialized and, and lack in other areas. So we, we created a second priority, which for our front row players was to lift in the line out. For our second row players, it was to clear in the rucks. Uh, for the back row players, it was to jump in the line out. So we just switched those two positions because they have to do both. For 9 and 10, it was um, the accelerations. For 12 and 13, it was lateral movement, being able to evade defenders. And then for 11, 14, and 15, it was the ability to vertically jump and secure a ball in the air when they got kicked it. And then what we did was we tried to create exercises which fit in the context of those four phases that I told you about. So we have a combination of different things. Um, we have obviously the, the high speed strength stuff that I talked to you about, which was the uh, jumps, medicine ball throws, and, and plyometrics. And we also consider uh, the, the contractile force stuff in, in the power to be part of our room for specialization. Everything else is pretty general. Everybody needs strength. Everybody needs to do some accessories. Everybody needs work capacity. Everybody needs to sprint. There's some obviously variation in the sprints according to your position, but those two main blocks is where we specialize. So in our phase one, because it's a general phase of training, everybody does the same thing. Our, our base thing in phase one is, can you jump, hop, and bound in all three planes of movement and do it safely. Because if you can't do those things, we have no business specializing because for one, it's not safe and two, you don't need it yet. Yeah. In phase two, what we do is we just make sure once you've done all those things, do you have clean running mechanics? So we, we steal from Verkashansky here, we do the, the extensive build into intensive uh, jumping exercises. So things like our ankle jumps, our squat jumps, our scissor jumps, uh, tuck jumps on one day. And then the other day, we do her, her extensive running drills. Um, I couldn't do all of her extensive stuff because they would break. You know, I don't think she deals with 250-pound donkeys with poor movement. <laughs> and then um, once we've done that in phase two, that's then when we specialize. When we specialize in phase three, you're going to get one exercise, which is a jump, medicine ball, throw, apply metric for your position. And you're going to get one um, contractile power exercise. I've got to say that the contractile stuff in phase one and two is real general. In phase one, we do extensive barbell squat jumps, bench press throws, trap bar jumps, and push jerks. When we go into phase two, it becomes intensive, and we start measuring velocity outputs and so on using gym aware. When we get into phase three, it's more specific for position. So to give you an example, we've said that a front row player is going to be judging their ability to push in the scrum. So the, the kind of jump exercise that we like to use for them is a seated long jump. So we'll sit them down on a box to remove that stretch reflex because that's not a, a factor in what they do, which obviously trying to match lots of aspects of the skill in terms of dynamic co correspondence. So joint angles, direction and magnitude of force, movement velocities, contact time, and so on. So we'll do paired together a seated long jump, and then we will do uh, a horizontal isometric into the squat rack. So we're trying to train the kind of higher speed, higher velocity stuff with the contractile stuff another example would be for example a an outside back we've said that they want to be really really good at top end speed so we'll use an intensive plyometric bound for for distance and we'll pair that with a dynamic band hip extension which i kind of stole from from franz bosch that's one of the few things he does that i like <laughs> and then we'll go into phase four we'll just drop the volume right down to that um, we're not looking at development, developing those abilities. We just want to hold on to what we've got and, and concentrate on the field, which is where we're probably going to be as we arrive into the World Cup. And we'll, tr we'll try and maintain that all the way through to the final when we win it. <laughs> Hopefully, right. Fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would uh, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, so yeah. then you've also mentioned readiness a couple times. Yeah. How does that play in with all of this as well? I'm going to give you another plug because um, readiness was one of those things where I'd, 
I kind of thought about it, it kind of made sense to me. But uh, you know, people talk about these aha moments. You sit down and you go, fuck me, I'm a fraud. Like, I have, <laughs> I have no business being a coach. And I've, I've had plenty of those in my career, but one of the most significant was sitting in the Central Virginia Sports Performance Seminar and hearing Val from a mega wave speak. He didn't have any notes. He just stood up there for, I think it was two and a half hours. Just about. He, he broke it down for two and a half hours. And I will say as a side note, after that, I went home and rewrote my master's thesis. <laughs> but one of the things that he made me realize is that this whole idea of preparation versus readiness. When you're in a high state of readiness, that's when performance is best. Um, when you're in a low state of readiness, you're going to suck. There's the, the difference in performance at the elite level is very rarely to do with long-term changes. It's just to do with fluctuations. And to an extent, as strength coaches, we're in control of managing those fluctuations to try and ensure the best possible performance at the right time when we want it. So that was one thing that made me think of it. And another thing is, obviously, when you're in a high state of readiness, um, injuries are less likely, you're going to train better and hopefully deliver a stronger stimulus to the body and elicit adaptation. Um, we don't have the money uh, or the resources to, um, to be using a mega wave system and try and measure all of those seven different physiological systems at once. So I tried to be extremely cheap and um, innovative, and my my reckoning was, well, Val's kind of said the CNS is, is the head of the totem pole. Stress occurs when the CNS perceives something to be a threat to its homeostasis. So if the CNS is stressed, the likelihood is that everything else is going to be in a state of stress. If it's not, it's not. So we used a questionnaire, and we were really big on asking them how they felt. And obviously, neuromuscular system supports quite a lot of what we're doing. So we use a, a standing broad jump to, to assess our readiness. We can't use a vertical jump because um, we don't have the money for uh, mats. We have to do a lot of this catch side. So you can really take a jump mat on grass. And um, we obviously travel a lot. So the less we have to tra uh, travel with the better. So we, we just use a standing broad jump. We, every, we give all of our coaches eight measures. And um, initially, we started out using those Charlie Francis percentages. Charlie Francis said you need to be at 95% of your best to deliver a strong enough stimulus to convince the CNS to adapt and improve speed, strength, and power. So we kind of set that as a benchmark. If you can't hit 95% of your best for us, you're not going to do high-intensity training or the, the highest CNS stresses. Um, the next number down, it's really unscientific, but it was 90%. And that was because I noticed that 90%, that's when they started complaining to me about not feeling good. So hmm. if you're below 90%, I'm not going to push you. If you're between 90 and 95%, you can train, but we're going to remove those high CNS stresses because that suggests to us that you're not in a state to be exposed to those stresses. If you're 95% or above, let's do it. And... We, we classify um, a high CNS stressor as anything where there's um, maximal speed, maximal strength, maximal power, a lot of fatigue, or a lot of contact. So anything above 85% of 1RM for us is out. Uh, any maximal intensity sprints, any intensive SST, um, any super intense conditioning or any contact elements in rugby, we'll try and pull them out of. Obviously, there's a lot less flexibility when you start to mess with rugby because you have to respect the coach's wishes. Um, so we'll remove those and then we'll just train more moderate CNS stresses. So it might be that we train in 70 to 85% range of strength. It might be if we do SST drills, we'll perform them in an extensive fashion. If we do speed work, it might just be that we do tempo rather than intensive sprinting. If we do conditioning it might be kind of low intensity work so it might be high intensity continuous training cardiac output work, all that kind of stuff if you're below 90 percent um, pretty much just hold your hand and and wait for you to get better we'll, we'll give them a little bit of we, we in argentina we call it bolite which means uh nightclub so we, we give them nightclub weights biceps triceps forearms neck traps just so they feel good yeah we let them do some abs and um you know, we'll, we'll put them on a treadmill, go for a walk. And I think if you're managing this, my experience has told me, if you're managing the stress of training well enough, you should very, very rarely have a guy in that below 90% range. Because to me, when they arrive on a high day, they should be above 95%. You push them, they drop down a bit to that 90 to 95. You give them some moderate training, let them recover, and you just repeat that process in, in hopefully a high-low fashion. And 
for us last year, using that approach, we we were cognizant of that and we really tried to respect that leading into our game against New Zealand, who, as I said, are the world champions. And uh, our final training session before that game at the squad of 31, we had 19 personal bests on the standing long jump and we only had two less than 95% that day. Hmm. And we still lost, but, you know. Well, the All Blacks are pretty good. They're not bad. They win 90% of their games. Oh, that's it? Yeah. So they're just an A minus, is what you're saying. Basically, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. So let's let's kind of go back and just rap about that a little because that might be something. I mean, the SST stuff is really great that you're talking about and how you break it down. And I, I hope people really understand it and can can think that like just taking a postcard and putting what you need to be good at to be and what you are good at and developing that, how really powerful that is. But looking, because I am lucky to be able to have the technology that we, we are able to implement, um, but to be able to take a long jump, and now how many reps or trials do they get? Is it just one? No, we get them three, and we, we record the best. Is it cold, or is it after a warm-up? We, we do a fairly standardized warm-up. Um, obviously, we have variation because they get bored, but we'll always kind of do it in terms of a floor-based mobility, stability work, kind of flexibility, some a little bit of potentiation. Right, but that's pretty much a non-variable though, right? That's Correct. And then you give them three long jumps. 95% mm -hmm. or higher is your green. 90 to 95% is your yellow. Correct. And then sub-90 is your red, and we're just beaching it and going for a walk. Yeah. That's pretty neat. and I, I, It's pretty neat. It's pretty creative. It's pretty brave. Um. Yeah, you, you get a little bit of kickback from that, especially whenever you go into a into a new club. Like the the idea that uh, a a set of strength work can be done not to failure, and the idea that some conditioning work can be done uh, without having significant discomfort is a foreign concept. Yeah. No, that's really that's really a fascinating idea, and it worked really well. Obviously. Um, it's working okay. Well, yeah, but like you said, the, the results and the, the ability to kind of have a fluid periodization with it and being able to have simple alterations isn't the right phrase, but you know what I mean. like Contingencies. Yeah, so like just going from intensive to extensive is not hard, yeah. and it's not something that most people are going to fight over. Going from high speed to tempo, you can. They're easy sells. Let me say that yeah. to, to athletes. You you don't have to to argue with them because you don't have to really pull the wool over their eyes because you're still getting something done. Yeah, I really yeah. like that. I think that's really that's really interesting. It's really um, that really hits that really hits uh, close to home with with a with an easy way to be able to do that because it is, it's not easy to be able to handle those things. I mean, obviously I would recommend being able to attach everyone to, you know, to, to have, to be able to open their phone like this and, you know, hit that button and have that come up, you know, yeah. I, mean, but <laughs> I, I do know that, you know, that, that in the world we live in, not everyone is, able and feasible to do that nor does everyone have the time necessarily to be able to do that yeah like um, i'll be honest like it's it's me and another guy that's it for 38 players at the moment and with the gps we, we collect an rpe for every session we we calculate all the minutes so we have an idea of the load um uh, a personal weakness of mine is that I'm not good enough. I'm very good at collecting data. I need to be better at processing and presenting data to coaches in a, in a fashion which they fully grasp the value of. But yeah, like, I think this is, I had a conversation with somebody last night about this as well. The way that sports science and data collection is going in sport is that it's becoming a specialist position within itself. I know of, of teams within rugby that you are the GPS guy. They will pay you a full-time wage just to do the GPS. And I think you have to be you have to be careful of not 
you know, not seeing the wood for the trees. Do you know what I mean? Like you have to just try and get those few things and it's to an extent it's difficult for me at times to do because I know I need to be thinking of this, this, this and this, but I don't have the time to or the resources to. So I just try and I think, you know, the best thing you can do is just speak to your players. How do you feel? Oh yeah, if that's the, all you can do, that's all you can do. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm there with you, man. I mean, I, I got to do it all myself. Lucky for me, I've only got 15 guys and you know, we are lucky enough to be able to have the resources where we can take, you know, and, and work with a group like Coach Me Plus, and they can put something like that together. I don't know if you can see it or not. Where it's yeah, just it's nice. that's just our guys, and that's that's my weight room report for everything yeah. that we do, and we do it all at breakfast every day. Their questionnaire, their Omega Wave, what they're eating, they weigh in when they walk in, and that all goes right into that cloud-based application. This tells me the readiness their omega tree, their questionnaire score, um, their tension index, and their resting heart rate. And all of those have specific parameters where I've labeled green, yellow, red, so I know coming in what we're looking at for a day training. And if there's things that come up here that I need to pull the Omega Wave app out for, great. Um, you know, I mean, that's always in my, my back pocket. Um, we have a report just like that that goes to the coaches that is body weight, Readiness, load from practice the night before, duration for practice the night before, uh, and RPE maybe. And again, those have green, yellow, reds. And I, you know, again, like like I say all the time with these things, people get too wrapped up in what they say and and what they mean, as opposed to just. There's times where numbers are just numbers, you know, and it's. If if a kid messes up, maybe you got to educate him a little or. If yeah. it's a day we gotta go, we gotta go. You know, it's the question I always get is, well, would you be able to talk to us about time and, and what they should be able to do in the game? And I'm like, hell no, no, <laughs> no. I'm not gonna get into that. I'll give you guys yeah. breakdowns. Like we know when we're over certain thresholds in the in the past, we may not have won as many as high of a percent of those games as we have below it. But that yeah. still doesn't that's mean... Sometimes, you know, that's, that's a bit, uh, it can be for some coaches a bit of pill to swallow. I spoke to Sean Mister about this uh, last week. It's a bit of pill to swallow, but sometimes reducing your impact on a team will benefit the team. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, MFing the guys in practice will make them play better. Sometimes, you, you, if your athlete gets a little bit weaker and a little bit slower, but technically much, much better, the team is going to win. And you kind of... You have to think team first. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Ain't nobody ever won a basketball game in the squat rack. I'll tell you that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I'd love it. Well, Kira, man, this has been an awesome talk. Some huge nuggets. I can't thank you enough for taking the time out. I know no, you're busy you. as hell right now, bro. Um, yeah, it's all right. I've got a lot of downtime. Yeah. Well, we'll uh, in Argentina. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get this up as quick as we can, man. People are going to love this. Thank you so much, brother. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Rugby Strength Coach, thank you very much. We'll be in touch soon. Cool. Cheers, man. Man, a huge thank you to today's guest, Argentina Rugby Strength and Conditioning Coach, Mr. Rugby Strength Coach, Kier Wenham Flat. Guys, I mean, nuggets galore. The, the guy did a great job just laying it all out there and, and, and letting us know what he's doing and what he did and what he's seen. I can't thank him enough. I hope you guys can take stuff away from it. I mean, shoot, just the idea of the postcard in and of itself is, is absolutely fantastic. I, I love the talk, took so much away from it, and I hope you guys do as well. And with everything that we do, guys, as always, please, any comments, questions, anything, post away. Let us know. Um... Kier's definitely going to be back on, guys, and it's if you have questions for him that you want answered, we're going to get them up either in a podcast or we'll have them written out. Uh, don't hesitate. And if you do, guys, enjoy the stuff that we put out, please share it, share it, share it. We're just trying to put information out there to help people get better. And as always, guys, thank you so much for being part of this. We will see you next week with another great guest. Have a great day.